من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم العن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين قالت الزهراء عليها السلام أيها الناس اعلموا أني فاطمة وأبي محمد أقول عودا وبدأ ولا أقول ما أقول غلط ولا أفعل ما أفعل شططا لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فإن تعزوه وتعرفوه تجدوه أبي دون نسائكم وأخ ابن عم دون رجالكم ولنعم المعزي إلي صدقة الزهراء صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Whenever you meet someone, the first thing you generally do is you introduce yourself. In order to remove any confusion as to who you are, even if someone is to call you on the telephone, and when they call you on the telephone, they say, hello, um, is this so-and-so? What is your natural reaction? Who are you? You want them to introduce themselves first. When someone's coming to say something or speak something to you, you want to know who they are. Who is it that I'm talking to? We introduce ourselves to remove any shroud or any doubt that may exist. And this is why, as Muslims, we are expected and our duty is to introduce Islam to the world. And the best form of introducing Islam or bringing forth Islam is through our action. Letting people understand this religion through our action and who we are. I just want to... I want to do this, and we have to do this, because our religion, as you know, has been hijacked. Not only by the Salafist movement or the Wahhabi movement, as they don't like to be called, but also by people that wear the garb of the Shia and claim to be Shia, they've hijacked our religion too. And they've got up and they've spoken in the same mannerisms that these people have. And we have to introduce our religion to the people. We have to let the people know what our religion is. Because if you were to ask anybody that is knowledgeable, that understands who the biggest enemy or what the biggest enemy of Islam is. If I was to ask you, who is the biggest enemy of Islam? Some people say, all right, a shaitan al-akbar. They might say, the United States of America. Or some people might say, the Zionist entity. But the biggest enemy of Islam is what? Is ignorance. The biggest enemy of Islam is al-jahl. Al-insanu adu ma yajhal. It is known that humans portray or have enmity towards what they are ignorant of. How often have you said something to someone and they say, but I thought you Muslims do this. How often you see that these, when you hear someone say 
that Muslims oppress women. And then they go up to a woman and they go, why do you wear hijab? She says, I choose to wear hijab. You choose? You actually have a choice in the matter? Yes, I choose to wear the hijab that I wear. And a lot of people are ignorant to this. And likewise, if you notice the way the Imam him, dealt with their enemies, there was a reason why they dealt in this manner. And this is why we have to, when we even deal with the Wahhabis in the world today, we're not supposed to treat them with a cold shoulder. We're not supposed to treat them with stiffness. We're supposed to treat them like the Imams treated their enemies. Because many of these people, although they wear the short attire, they have the long beard, they don't know anything. They're ignorant. They go into their mosques and their sheikh gets up and says, She Iraf the Kafir. He has a tail. On the light of Ashura, they have a massive, uh, you know, whatever you call it. We won't go into full details. But this is the information that they're given. This guy sits there and he says, This Shia says this, this Shia does that. And the person's just listening. He's been bombarded, bombarded with what I called several weeks ago when the people that were here. What I call disinformation. Remember what I said? There's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is when someone gives you information that is wrong, but it's not deliberate. But disinformation is when someone gives you information that is wrong and it is deliberate. They deliberately mislead you. And this is what the sheikhs do. They deliberately misguide the masses and this is why, if you notice, when we talk about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam and the Shami, when the man comes and abuses the Imam and the Imam says to him, You are from Sham, straight away he knew what school this person attended. This person had been with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, he knew that he had been received all this disinformation. And he had to remove this deliberate false information that he had given. As we know, this is pretty much what you read in the newspaper. The journalists would rather be first and wrong than be second and right. They want to put the story up straight away. They don't care. If you remember the incident with Pauline Hansen when the, in the Melbourne, when the car was hitting those people, she automatically said, oh, Muslim terrorist attack. She didn't even know who the driver was. But automatically she said Muslim because she had to put it out there and to mislead the people. To keep the people with this solid hatred. But the problem is when the person wears the attire of Islam. When the person says I'm a sheikh. And the person calls the people to Islam and then deviates them. You have many of these people on television. You see them and they deviate the masses. They talk things and they sound. I mean, like the Quran says about the munafiqeen in the Quran. It says when you listen to them, you like what they say. See, they feed you what you want to hear. But God says, humul adu. They are the enemy. Fahdarhum. Beware of them. These people that call in the wrong way. So, oh, the only the easiest way to distinguish is you look at what the Quran says, what Ahl al Bayt say, and then you look at these people. Look what their agendas are. Who are they serving? Who do they serve? The agendas, who are they serving? Who do they support with what they do? And you can work out if it's with Ahl al-Bayt or if it's with Iblis. So anyway, this is why on the day that Az-Zahra alayhi salam came to put forth her claim for the rights of Amir al-Mu'mineen, for her rights, she introduced herself. And you will find with her introduction, it is very strong and it's very deliberate in the way she introduces herself. If you take a look at Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam, when he introduces himself in Damascus, he says, Ana, he says, I am the son of who? Of all the things that he mentions, when he mentions Ali ibn Abi Talib wasalam, alayhi, he mentions two qualities of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they're deliberately mentioned. It's not like when he was selecting them 
He said, which of his, when we think of Amir al-Mu'mineen, we think Amir al-Mu'mineen. We think Ya'asub al-Din. He's the purest of faith. He is the commander of the faithful. We think of all these great qualities, but he chose deliberately too. Why? Because there was disinformation and there was confusion with these two things. What were they? He said, I am the son of As-Siddiq al-Akbar wal-Farooq al-A'zam. He said, I am the son of the great truthful one. And the son of the great, when we say Al-Farooq, Al-Farooq is the one that is, when you say someone that distinguishes, or as if you see um, the criterion, we could say, the one that is the, the thing that distinguishes between right and wrong. Why did he mention these two titles? Because the first title had been hijacked and given to Abu Bakr. They call him Abu Bakr as siddiq And the second title had been hijacked and given to Umar. They call him Umar al farooq And these two titles were who? These two titles were the titles of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. So the reason he said, I am the son of as siddiq al-Akbar wal farooq al-A'zam. So people say, hold on, he's not related to Abu Bakr. He's not related to Umar. So who does he mean? There's someone else that carries these titles. See, he's swaying this, this information. This is the importance of the introduction. So when Az-Zahra salawatullahi wa salamu alayha said, Ayyuhan nas, i'lamu anni Fatima. The first thing she said, no, that I am Fatima. Wa Abi Muhammad. Why would she say this? Now, could it be that to say that the Rasulullah was a good man and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? You know, as I say, that generally we respect people because of their lineage. Someone's from a good family, we respect them. And generally, we treat them in this manner. And it's something we take into consideration when dealing with them. So we say, oh, you know, you know, like father, like son, or something like that. We take these things into consideration. In our lives and in our dealings, this guy's a son of so-and-so. Was that the reason why she said this? If this reason was important, then why is it when it comes to marriage, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, in man tardawna deenahu wa khulaquhu. When someone comes that you are pleased with their faith and you are pleased with their akhlaq, then marry them. And one man says, wa nasabahu ya Rasulullah. His lineage, where he comes from. And then Rasulullah repeats the narration again. He says, if the one that comes to you, you are pleased with their faith and you are pleased with their moral conduct, then marry them. And if you do not, he continues the narration. After someone says their lineage, so Rasulullah, he indicates lineage is not taken into account when it comes to marriage. You are supposed to look for a person of good character. So in some circumstances it has effect, some circumstances it doesn't. But we generally treat people because good and based on who they are from. Generally, when someone is the son of someone that was good to you, you respect them because they're the son of that person. When you meet someone that's a son of someone that is of an authoritative, authoritative position, you treat them in this manner. As the narration says, Jahidu turithu abna'akum majda. That if you do good and you strive in life, you will give your children dignity. This is why, if you take a look, that the title that we give to the person that is of the Posterity of Rasulullah, we call him Sayyid. This wasn't a title that was used at the time of the Imams. This is a title that was used later. Why? It's a title of respect. Because Sayyid means master. And to give them that respect that this person's from the posterity of Rasulullah. So it's the title of respect. Even though the ones that you see today are of what? They're of 38th or 40th grandchild. Yes, we still give this title of respect in, in this manner. So anyway, even when 
in other circumstances, it comes like this. When you go to a country where someone's son is a son of a shaheed, they'll tell you, you heard the Ibn al-Shaheed. People respect him because his father did something. Even though the person could be a pesky little runt running around, people respect him because his father was a martyr. Even if the person's a son of a Rajul Din, people respect him because he's the son of a Rajul Din. This is the way the world reacts. However, let's take a look at this point where Fatima alayha salam, when she says that my father is who he is, is Rasulullah. Is it a form of nepotism where you have to treat her good because her father was Rasulullah? Or did Rasulullah give her this status because she is his daughter? It's like when we say in the sermon that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sermon of the Jumu'ah, he is reading and Imam Hussein enters the masjid and they say that Rasulullah, I think he falls or something like that, that Rasulullah gets off the mambar and as we know, Salat al-Jumu'ah this was in the sermon of Juma. Salat al Juma is what? Is a part of what? It's part of Salah. You cannot get up and pray while Khutbah al Juma is taking place. It's part of the prayer. So it's, it's an, it, it, there's actual parts with this Salah. The Salat of Juma is not complete without the Khutbah. So why did Rasulullah leave the Khutbah and pick up the Imam? And kiss the Imam? Is this a form of nepotism? He's my son. They asked Rasulullah, it is, as, it is as if you like or love Imam Hussein. And he says, how can I not love al Hussein? Wa inna Allah yuhibbu man ahabba Hussein. How can I not love al Hussein when Allah loves? Or inna, certainly, or verily, most surely Allah loves whoever loves Hussein. So it wasn't about him being the grandson of Rasulullah. And like this was not about her being the daughter of Rasulullah. This is a status that she has a right to. And it's not a birthright. It's a right from the creator of the heavens and the earth. And then she says in this, In other words, she says, I say this repetitively. Or continuously, and I will continue to initiate saying this. I will not stop saying that who I am. She says, "Wala aqulu ma aqulu ghalat." I am not saying anything mistakenly. Wala afalu ma afalu shatata. When you look at this, and you understand what she's saying here, that she's not saying this aimlessly. It's not like when someone says, you know, there's people you meet, and he says, um. Did you know my father was the right-hand man to the, Her Majesty the Queen? You know those people, they always want to tell you, you know, who their family was from. And, you know, my great-grandfather, he um, fought in Gallipoli. Or my great-grandfather, he was the one that um, was one of the enforcers in some squad. Or something like that. Someone that wants to say who they are. This isn't the case. Here, this isn't the case. She's saying this is not aimless. I'm not saying this without a point. There is a point to what this. What I am saying. Then she mentions, very importantly, she says, "Lakad jaakum rasulun min anfusikum." Firstly, she's saying to them who this messenger of Allah is. From you he came, from amongst you. This isn't someone from far away. And then it says, Azizun alayhi ma anittum harisun alaykum bil mu'minina ra'ufun rahim. Okay. You know when they say that the Prophet left and he left no successor. But when Abu Bakr left, he left Umar as a successor. If I was to ask you, when you use this term, um, harisun alaykum, if I was to tell you, that the Rasul, when someone's haris, you know those ones that, you know that mother that follows the child, oh careful, don't touch this. They very, look, they look towards this person, they look after them. If Rasulullah was haris, meaning Rasulullah really cared for the Muslims, why do you just leave and leave him without any guidance and let them fight each other? 
But Abu Bakr was more haris. Why? Because when he left the world, he left Umar. He left Umar to look after the Muslims. He left a successor. This is what you're saying. When you say Rasulullah left the world without a successor, he's not haris over the Mu'mans. He just left them. So she is making this point. My father, Rasulullah, is someone that was ardently anxious towards you. He's someone that worried about you. He's someone that was concerned with you. And then she says, Harisun alaykum, this is a verse in the Quran, mind you. Bil mu'minin ra'ufun rahim. Bil mu'minin. With the believers, he was ra'uf rahim. He was kind and he was merciful. He was nice and merciful, kind and merciful to everyone, but especially with the believers. And then she says to them there, فَإِن تَعْزُوهُ وَتَعْرِفُوهُ تَجِدُوهُ أَبِدُونَ نِسَائِكُمْ If you were to identify and recognize this man that worried about you and was concerned with your affairs, you will know that he was my father unlike any of your women. This same person that was concerned with your affairs and look at the way that you are dealing with me now. And then she says, the brother of my cousin, the one that you have taken, Ali ibn Abi Talib, was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam twice paired up the mu'mins with brothers. Once he did this with the muhajirin, paired them each up with a brother, and he took Ali as his brother. And then when he paired the muhajirin with the ansar as brothers, every muhajir had to be paired with an ansar. What happened is at this point, everyone expected him now to pair Ali with one of the ansar. Once again, he paired him with himself. So she says, he is the brother of my cousin, Ibn Ammi, he also meaning my husband, Ali ibn Abi Talib, unlike any of your men. Because many wanted to marry. Many wanted to take the hand of Fatima al-Zahra Many wanted to marry this lady of light, the daughter of Rasulullah. And this was fadl, and this virtue was only given to Amir al mumnin And then she says, وَلَا نِعْمَ الْمَعْزِيُّ إِلَيْهِ what an excellent identity. When we recognize, introduce who he was. She wants to mention Rasulullah. Then when she mentions this, she moves on to the sermon. She says to them, أَمَا كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَبِي يَقُولُ الْمَرْءُ يُحْفَظُ فِي وُلْدِهِ She said, did not my father Rasulullah. She keeps saying this, if you realize... You will never find in any of the hadith with Ahl al bayt when they talk generally, they'll say, An Fulain, Imam An Rasulullah. They'll never say, An Jaddi Rasulullah. There's no point in them explaining it to these people. Or you will never see a Zahra alayhi salam would say, An Abi Rasul. Here it's deliberate. It's deliberate for these people to understand because these people are ignorant. Not ignorant only, these people have also got this bigotry that prevents them from wanting to know. So then she says that did not my father Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that a man is upheld and remembered by who? By his children. When you want to remember someone, you want to look up to, up to someone, you say, Allah yurhamu bayyak, he was a good man. They remember the father, they say, you are from this person, I respect you. You are from this person, I like you. Because you are from this person. This is the way they treat you. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This is on that perspective, on a morally, mor morally speaking with your relationship to Fatima alayhi sallam. Morally speaking to those, morally in our natural day-to-day -day life, we treat well the people that are related to the people we love. Then she talks about your spiritual obligation. Your spiritual obligation... Towards Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. One of the main verses that's reiterated and repeated and emphasized on the manabar day and night is inna ma yuridu Allah liyutib ankum rishs ahl al bayt wa yitahirukum tatira. Over and over and over and over and over again you will hear this verse. 
Allah Azza wa Jal placing their position that they are people that excel in moral character. They are people that are free of abomination. They are people that are free of uncleanliness. They are people that are free from sin. They are exemplars of the faith. They are the ones we should look at when I hear someone stand on some television station and speaking to know whether he's actually speaking or whether he's prating or whether he's barking. To understand, I measure his words with the words of God and the words of Ahlul Bayt This is the scale that I measure them by. And we also look at another narration that you hear day and night. Inni tarikun fikum Why is it these two narrations, one's a verse and one's a narration, why do we repeat them all the time? Do you know why... If you just keep this narration and think about it, you will never go astray. This is what Rasulullah says. Lan tadillu. Lan. Lan is different to lam. When I say lan, you never will. Never. There is no chance that you will go astray. Abada. Ever. That's also an emphasis. He didn't even have to say abada. Lan tadillu ba'di bikfi. That's enough. To say lan tadillu ba'di, you will never go astray. Abada. He says it again. To emphasize that you will never, ever, ever go astray if you hold on to these two weights. The book of God and what? And the Atra, Ahl al Because if you take a look at all the problems of those that are swayed away from religion, those that have deviated away from the path, you will find they swayed away from what, from what religion? Those that get up on the mumbar, they get up on television stations, and they slander, and they curse people, and then you read in the Quran in blatant black and white, says لا تسب الذين يدعون من دون الله. Don't swear and slander to those that call other than God. This is this is a nahi. And then you have all these hadith on taqiyya from the Imam that taqiyya is my religion. Whoever has no taqiyya has no religion. You have this over and over and over, it's mentioned. Then you get people on television, they get up and they start to slander everybody. They swear about everybody and they do it deliberately, not caring because they're in secure homes while people are being massacred around the world due to their words. Then you get the other side. You get the ones that perform sujood to the establishment that they live in. You get the ones that, for example... You're supposed to do taqiyya when you're living in countries where you're under stress. But then you get the ones that do extra. They do more than taqiyya. They do whatever the, the overlords wish. They'll sit there, they'll get up and say, listen, um, I believe you should incarcerate Muslims more. Stand above them. Make sure they don't build any more mosques. Make sure they don't build any more centers. Watch them over. You know, they're going to build a state in your country. Beware of this. These people are also against the book of God. These people are against Ahl al -Bayt. Check out the verses in the Quran. Check out... Because they make up lies. These are calumnies. These are lies against the Muslims. And they do it deliberately so they can get brownie points with the establishment. The problem is you need to remember, see these people that do this, that sit there and talk up, write letters to Jackie Lambie and do prostrations to Pauline Hansen. These people, they get chewed, chewed up and spat out. Do you remember Iktimal Hajj Ali? Look her up, Google her. Iktimal Hajj Ali is one of the finest examples of what they do to you when you sell your soul. وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ You sell your religion, they sell you first. Do you know why? They have more respect for someone that has belief in their faith than someone that sells their faith. Because someone that, you know, we say once, uh, I can't use the actual term on the mind, but it's not good. But once... Uh, a bad person, always a bad person. The actual proverb is a, is a bit of a bad word not to be used on the number. So once you're this, you're always this. You know? You sell out, you're always going to be a sellout. If you sell out your religion, of course you're going to sell them out. And if you take a look at Jesh Lahad, the army that Antoine Lahad built, the South Lebanese army, when they left South Lebanon and they went to on the exodus to occupy Palestine, to be greeted with open arms by the Zionist entity, what did they do? They started shooting at them. They started fighting against them. They didn't want them. 
Why? Why would you want some traitors to enter your country? <laughs> they already sold out their own people. Why would you want them to enter your country and sell you out? This Iqtima al Hajj Ali, she used to get up. And you'd see her all over the papers, fully in makeup, no hijab, and saying she wants to represent Islam. In typical heretic fashion. And then she got up and she had a champagne with the Prime Minister. And she said, damn, it's just alcohol. I don't know why anyone's making such a fuss. This is what she did. And I said, her downfall's coming and it's going to be at their hands. Because you know this, not because we know the future, it's because we've seen it happen. It's a pattern. A year went by, the next second, a massive cocaine drug bust and she was one of the people involved. She was dealing with all these, of course, these people, trust me, they come outside, they show taqwa. But inside, mate, they're cupboards full of bones. Not skeletons, mate. They have mass burial grounds in there. All these people that pull... You remember when they caught that guy in Iraq and they pulled, pulled him out and they said that he used to kill people because he was a mu'man taqwa. He was against the Shia, the Rafida. And then they asked him, why did they kick you out of the mosque? You used to be an imam of the masjid. Why? He said, uh, because I was Salafi. And they said, no, no. They asked him again. They said, is it true, the brothers over there, said that you and them performed homosexual acts inside the mosque. And he said, oh, we repented to Allah. He admitted to it. In the masjid. And the whole time he was like, Abdul Malik Marwan, Hamam al masjid. He was sitting there, you know, uh, and I think it was Marwan. How come Abdul Malik Hamam al masjid? Abdul Malik Marwan, the one they say he wouldn't even step on an ant because of the amount of taqwa he had. And the moment he took power, he showed his colors. If anyone orders me to fear God, I will strike their neck. The same one that wouldn't step on an ant. These same people that portray this faith, portray their piety, wait till they get exposed. You end up, these people probably live in Oxford Street on a nightly basis, all dressed up and you wouldn't even know. Then they get up and say, ban all these Muslims. And then they get exposed because they sell their religion before they get on television. They sold it a long time ago. And the skeletons come up and they get exposed. I mean, they expo well, for God's sake, they exposed David Beckham and he's, uh, he's, uh, he's their love child. They exposed him. So you think they're not going to expose these guys? They'll sell them out tomorrow. Anything for a good story. This is why we have to hold on to the hadith in Nitari Kun Fikum Kitabullah, pick up the Qur'an, the Qur'an that's neglected, pick it up, read it. And read the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhi When someone gets up and speaks, if they are contrary to these books, don't listen to them. They are contrary to what's written in these books, why should I listen to them? Why should I sit there and listen to someone that says, I remember one person, he was on television, and I couldn't believe he did. The way he mocked the hadith, I couldn't believe the way he mocked it. They said to him, how is it you have such a good memory? They said, you have a, such a good memory, very intelligent. There's a hadith, you know that one says, eat 21 raisins every morning? He said, it's because I eat 21 raisins every morning. And they started laughing. This is what he said. He was mocking the hadith. And then as if to say, it's, it's my power. You know, God has given me this intelligence. So I have accumulated this intelligence myself. Rather than attribute this to Allah who can take this from you in an instant. So anyway, Fatima alayhi salam was bringing this all to their attention. Your obligation as a believer is to defend Fatima alayhi salam. It is your obligation. Because if you give someone the situation where you are to ask them, Fatima staked the claim that she was... Fadak was a haq. And then you say, and Abu Bakr said, no, it's not your haq. And you call Fatima a siddiqa and you call Abu Bakr a siddiq Which one's truthful? You call one to be the truthful one and the other one's a truthful one. They have to choose. You can't sit there and say, I'll take both. Say the Jafar, whoever was here for his lecture last, late to Jummah, he mentioned in his lecture that a man came up to Amir al Mu'minin. And he said to Amir al-Mu'mineen, I love you and I love Fulan and Fulan. 
You know those people that say, I love everybody. He said, I love you and I love your enemies. And the Imam said to him, you are a'war. Means you are one-eyed. He said, either you will start to see with both eyes, or either you will become blind. You can't share. The basis of religion, as the narration says, the narration says that the basis of religion is love for Allah and hate for Allah. You can't say that Allah says love everybody. Allah loves those that do good. Allah loves those that are righteous. Allah loves those that repent. Allah loves those that cleanse. Allah does not love the oppressor. And Allah shows this. Although He teaches you how to treat the oppressor. When He sent Musa to Pharaoh, He says to him, What? Idhab ila Pharaoh, innahu tagha. The Pharaoh has been rebellious. He's gone against my commands. And then He says, Look at the way He speaks to him. He says, What? He says, Speak a nice word to him. Although he's my enemy, although he's evil, speak a tender word to him. And do you know what the narration says? It says, from this command that Musa ibn Amran went to the palace, it was a garrison town of where Fir'aun was, and he stood at the gate. And they say he came every day at the gate and he would say, I am the messenger of God. I'm here to speak to Fir'aun. And they would say, leave. And then he would come the next day and say the same thing. Imagine it was one of us. Imagine it was me right now and I've got a stick. This stick has got the potential of turning into a serpent. It will split the sea. It will make water come out of stone. I've got this stick in my hand. I'll come up to the guy and go, mate, I'm going to give you a very good deal today. You open those gates, okay? Or by the end of the day, they'll be reading your fatah. This is how we deal with situations. We deal with the stick. That's how we are. Musa, God says, speak tender to Pharaoh. So Musa could have said this. There's another thing I would do. I would stand and say, God specifically says Pharaoh, not his guard. So I'll knock the guard out of the way. He specifically said Pharaoh. Musa remained in this state, returning and returning and returning, believing in what Allah had told him to do. This is how they spoke. This is how Ahlul Bayt spoke. To those that Allah hated. And then when he entered, how did he enter? They say the court jester came in. You know the ones that make the king laugh? As he came in, he said, he walked in, he said, I am a messenger of God, I wish to speak to Pharaoh. They say Pharaoh was slumped in his chair and he stood up. He said to the jester, what did you just say? And the jester got scared. He said, I said what I said. He said, what did you say? Repeat it. He said, I'm a messenger of God and I wish to speak to Pharaoh. He said, where did you hear this? He said, there's a guy outside that comes every day and says this. So I was mimicking him. And Pharaoh calls his guards. He said, brings this man in next time he comes. I want to speak to him. This is the way he was brought in. Yet Musa alayhi salam remained speaking in the most tender manner that he could. This is how we're supposed to speak. This is how you bring Islam. However, you don't slob at your enemy's feet. You're polite, but you don't do sujood. You don't make up lies so you can buy favor with them. Because Allah is the one that makes you mighty. Al-Azzatu lillah wa li wa lil mu'mineen. If you take a look when Amir al-Mu'mineen tonight is there at the Jum'ah and his narration in his dua, dua of late the Jum'ah, he says, Ilahi in wada'atani faman dalladhi yarfa'uni. وَإِنْ رَفَعْتَنِي فَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَضَعْنِي Oh Allah, if you put me down, no one, who will be the one that will raise me? And if you elevate me, if you raise me, you bring up my status, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَضَعْنِي If you take a look at Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم You will find 1,400 years of distortion and disinformation and neglect and people putting him down, and all these people, even people that get up on the mumbar in the name of Islam, putting him down, and you look at the exponential of the growth of Islam, and the exponential of the naming, that so much so that the most popular name, you look this up, this isn't a made up thing, in 
England, the most popular named name in England is Muhammad. Who would have ever believed this? Did you know they said that this was the case many years ago, but they didn't know. Guess why? Because how many people spell Muhammad the same? There's a double M, the single M, there's a U, there's the A. There's all different spellings. But when they united all the spellings to be one name, they realized it's the most popular name. It's the most named name, even though in the United Kingdom, if you look in the United, if you look in England, and just take a look at the UK, you take a look at England, the population of England is about 70 odd million. The population of Muslims there is 2 million, yet the most named name is Muhammad. Allah Azza wa Jal elevates and raises and gives might and glory and dignifies whoever he wishes. Do not in your life sell your religion for the sake of gaining glory because you will not gain it. Allah is the one that gives you glory. And this was the stance of Fatima alayhi salam. She could have sold out with her husband Amir al-Mu'mineen to Abu Sufyan and stood with him in order to take the Khalifa. But it wasn't this Khalifa they were after. They were after the Khalifa that Allah Azza wa had given them their right and in order to guide us and bring us into understanding. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal not to take us from this world except upon the path of Ali and Fatima alayhim as -salam. We ask Allah to hasten the reappearance of our master. الحجة ابن الحسن والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين